to have Tom Pining right here in the Berkshires. Um, not only does he teach at BCC, but he, he's written, written the Stokes Guide for, um, for amphibians and reptiles, and he leads trips uh, all over the country uh, and all over the world. And so uh, you don't want to hear me talk, you want to hear Tom talk, and so I'm going to turn this right on over to him. <laughs> There's got to be something else going on in Sheffield. <laughs> I had a few things with me. I've got some live animals. We've got some books. I had a couple of others, a couple of snakes that got out. Uh, <laughs> so there may be some empty seats shortly. <laughs> it's not my fault. I was dropped on my head as a child. So, so, so the Sheffield Land Trust. This is fantastic. You guys, um, there, there's virtually no better organizations than local land trusts. Nobody can leave here without doing something to help this group. And it is really important to do this, um, not only in this day and age, but in all days and ages. We have to protect land. And for me, who decided in fifth grade I wanted to be a herpetologist, and nobody stopped me, <laughs> told me there was a better way, uh, it has been kind of um, a, a tough go at it because conservation of critters that most people know very little about, or worse, hate, has been really a difficult struggle. I've survived it. But some of the species that we're going to talk about today haven't. And since Kathy had suggested with the land trust, they made up the title for this. They told me what to do. I've ignored it. <laughs> no. I thought I'd better tell you, how many of you remember hearing a story this summer about a rattlesnake in downtown Great Barrington? You don't know the whole story. <laughs> because it's really weird. And even though I've been working on these critters since I was eight like, years old, and now I'm four or five, but eight yeah. years old, they're still surprises. And I'm going to do a short introduction to this. So go ahead, and Kathy, and click this thing along. So we found a snake. Uh, I've got, there's four or five of us here in the Berkshires that have permits to deal with this endangered species, the timber rattlesnake. And uh, when people see them on roads, uh, I'll get a phone call or a, an email, uh, or if it's somebody's yard, uh, we'll get a call. And three or four of us will get down within a couple of hours and pick them up. So we found this snake uh, this summer. And we picked it up, and I, typically now, most of you should know this, but if not, we can microchip every snake, uh, just like your dogs and cats. Uh, they're better than dogs and cats, but just like them. And we have small little microchips that we inject under the skin, and they last forever, so we can identify everyone. So this snake didn't have any kind of uh, microchip in it. So I measure them, uh, we weigh them, we uh, take a, a, a scale clip for DNA analysis, blah, blah, blah. Next picture. And uh, when you release it, you know, half a mile off the road up to the mountains where they typically are from. And that's typically what happens. And it, it, uh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. So, while the lights are going down. <laughs> the, uh, so we collect all this data, and it works out really well. And uh, we can then now follow these animals for, for long periods of time. And, uh, oh, I'd say about half the snakes that we get every year from phone calls, and it's only six or seven at the most, uh, that we can actually get a hold of. Uh, about half of them are unmarked and brand new animals to us, and it's great. So that snake, um, oh, yeah, so I get lots of calls. Don't stay on that one. You're, you're right, okay, Kathy, I'm sorry. So I get calls from all over western Massachusetts. Uh, I grew up in the Connecticut Valley, and this was my big move west out here to the Berkshires. <laughs> So there's a snake in downtown Springfield. Uh, next picture. 
and I mean downtown Springfield. It was a rattlesnake, and I said, no, it isn't. The state folks called me. I said, it's impossible, and they said, no, and they sent me that picture that the EPO took, and the EPOs didn't bother telling any of us, so they decided to let it go in the nearest sort of forested mountain that they found. <laughs> so in the valley, I've got another five or six people who are rattlesnake permitted um, crazy people. And I sent him out, next one of them out, uh, next one, and he found the snake two days later. Mm -hmm. The same animal. It was, uh, it was uh, eight or 10 miles from, uh, from Springfield. Um, but anyway, he ran the microchip reader on it. It was the same snake from the Berkshires from two weeks earlier. <laughs> next picture. Um, you can tell he, Thought we were sure it was the same snake because we measured the photos. Next picture. Um, and so he did the pit tag reader next. And so here it went in 43 miles in seven days. The Connecticut River, the Turnpike, 91. <laughs> Hell, Route 7. <laughs> next. I mean, this is just weird. So we brought it back and put it way up on the mountain <laughs> and said, fine and dandy. And that was uh, whatever day, end of July. Next quick picture. And then we get a call <laughs> from the state that there's a rattlesnake in downtown Great Barron. <laughs> now, I didn't know there isn't. So, you know, the structure record had its own cute little story. And I got a copy of it. I got the snake. Uh, the division folks and Rennie Wendell from the Conservancy picked it up and uh, brought it back to their Dalton office. And, uh, and I got the snake. And, we're in a pit tag reader, next picture, and it's the same damn snake. <laughs> now, this was found right in the bank parking lot in Barrington. <laughs> Probably at the drive through I don't know. <laughs> next picture. So, it was starting down near Berkshire School, then Springfield, then the Valley, then the Berkshires. Now it's in downtown Gray Barrington. So, next picture, we picked it back up, and I did a home range. <laughs> 310 square miles. This is about the range of a black bear. This is the largest home range of any snake on earth. This is the most famous snake in really tiny circles that you can imagine. <laughs> Next. So, how did it do it? And this is the big deal, and I could use any ideas you have, because this is a group of very special people. <laughs> that you have good imaginations. We know snakes don't go to cities on their own. They don't like it. It's impossible for a snake to go in eight days, 44 miles. Uh, it's unlikely that a snake went even six miles to Great Barrington on its own without any help. And the probability that uh, the same animal arrives in two separate cities that far apart is virtually impossible. Next picture. So we have these hypotheses, and we have them all. My favorite one is the last one. <laughs> is the only answer that we have come up with. Now, I did this little presentation for a group of rattlesnake experts last fall, and they agree, aliens is the only normal answer. Aliens, you know, come here all summer, you see them driving around, but... <laughs> it wasn't a hawk. They don't drop snakes in cities for fun. At any rate, keep going. I, I don't want to do this to end. We thought maybe somebody had a secret radio transmitter inside there, and they were poaching it, playing with us, and... So I brought it to two different vets, and, and there's no transmitter inside them next. <laughs> uh, and then we thought, could it have hitchhiked? <laughs> a hitchhiking car. And a buddy of mine from the Valley Works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service sent me this picture. Uh, back in 2013, he and his buddy were driving around at night looking for rattlesnakes because there was no internet or something. And uh, <laughs> they went over there and found this rattles Pacific rattlesnake in the road. They stopped got out of the car, got their equipment out, and by the time they got all their equipment out, the snake had crawled under their car and was starting to go up into the wheel well. <laughs> and uh, I said, no way. Uh, next picture. Um, it turns out that the snake at Great Barrington was three feet in front of a car from a woman in Mount Washington who's in the Whitbeck family, which is the famous rattlesnake family of Berkshire County. These, this whole family is crazy and wonderful. <laughs> I brought the snake down to her car, 
and let it go. And three out of four times, it crawled into her real mouth. <laughs> I asked her if she had been rubbing in her, waxing her car with mouse goo or chipmunk pee. I didn't know what in the world. Anyway, next picture. <laughs> so, my sister lives over there. We released it there. Next picture. Then we, somebody said, is there a Berkshire Bank in Springfield? <laughs> And there is. It's three blocks, if you can see the little tiny yellow push pin on the bottom right. And then the bank is just underneath that Springfield word. Three blocks away. This is a snake that's making deposits. <laughs> With the help of you, I honestly don't have a freaking clue. Uh, yeah, next picture. Um, so the other thing is maybe a few of you, even out here in the wilderness, heard about the plane the state had to possibly start a population of rattlesnakes on an island in Plavin Reservoir where people aren't allowed. This is the biggest problem this endangered species, species has. Maybe this snake heard about it. <laughs> and got to Springfield, and it was just a short trip to Quabbin, and those damn EPOs caught it and brought it back, and then we brought it back to the Berkshires. Next, I think getting up to the last pictures, I put a radio transmitter on its rattle in September, and released it, and uh, Nature Conservancy folks have been tracking it. I went up with them in November. It's apparently in its winter den. We don't have a clue what's gonna happen this spring. <laughs> but I think that's the whole story. Uh, get rid of that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's gonna have babies next spring, next summer. I don't know. Anyway, we named her Odysseus, but <laughs> that's that. <laughs> so let me, t I told you that to tell you this. This is, um, so I'm going to give you some very brief overview of what I have been learning about and trying to find out about uh, these animals. So the first question is, why do they have secret lives? I mean, why don't we know more about these things? And the next picture will show you part of the reason I blame on this guy with his curly hair, Linnaeus. Oh, where are those two BCC students back there? Don't you start hiding on me. Who was, who was Linnaeus? Uh, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Who's the big L? Oh my God, starting with kingdom, what's the next one? He decided to develop that system of classification, and he's the one that made everybody use two Latinized names for every plant and animal on Earth. The general name and the specific name, the genus and the species, and it's the system we use today, and this was back in the 1750s. It's incredible. He did and wanted to compile a list of all the plants on Earth. Again, what you can do without cable. <laughs> he did it. And then, ran out of stuff to do, so he started to do the animals of the planet Earth. And when he got to the amphibians and reptiles, he introduced them this way. <laughs> These foul and loathsome creatures are abhorrent because of their cold body, pale color, cartilaginous skeleton, filthy skin, fierce aspect, calculating eye, offensive smell, harsh voice, squalid habitation, and terrible venom. <laughs> Do those look like foul and loathsome creatures up there? It started perps in the toilet. <laughs> a botanist. In Sweden, where they have three amphibians and reptiles total. At any rate, let's get going and take a look at these. If you look at stuff around the world, amphibians are totally amazing. They are in huge sizes. We have a salamander here in Berkshire County that gets to be 26 inches long, and nobody's ever seen it, except for two of you. Next. So let me go through some of these things. First of all, you should remember, even though um, some of this stuff was beat into you as a kid, if there's only three types of amphibians in the world. One are these weird 
worm-like things in the tropics called Sicilians. Ignore those. The other two types are those that grow up with a tail and they're called salamanders. If they grow up without a tail, they're called frogs. That's the lesson today, and that will be on the exam later on. <laughs> if you look at salamanders, a lot of people will say, well, let's go out and look for newts and salamanders. It's like saying, let's go look out for red wings and birds, <laughs> or lilies and plants. Newts are salamanders. They're just one family, and that handout that uh, some of you got a chance to get when you were coming in will help that. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Kathy, sorry. Uh, uh, let's move this along so I don't kill anybody. So most of you should know this. If you come out to the ponds now, well, you're going to die. But if we get another freeze and you feel safe on a pond, get on your belly, brush the snow off, look through the clear ice, and you will see these things swimming around under the ice. This is the red spotted newt that is so complex that we didn't even know what the juveniles were until 100 years ago. These things live underwater all the time. They've got lungs. They come up for a gulp of air into the ice. They're swimming there all year round. Their entire lifespan is in the water, except they lay the eggs in water in March and April. And they hatch into larvae. That little thing on the bottom left is a larval salamander with big, bushy external gills. At the end of the summer, they lose the gills, develop lungs, pop out and land. In the next picture I'll show you, they turn fluorescent orange. Oh, I haven't seen those. You can't walk on a Sheffield Land Trust trail at a day like this in another month without seeing these all over the place. These are so different from the adults that they thought they were a different species that were given a name, the red eft, E-F-T, which is a three-letter word for lizard-like amphibian found in the New York Times crossword puzzles. <laughs> this is the only reason you should read the Times. <laughs> So we thought these things lived three or four years as a red F. So after they become larvae, they hatch, uh, they hatch into larvae in the ponds all summer, lose their gills, develop lungs, pop it on land, turn fluorescent orange, and live 12 to 14 years on land. Nobody knows how far they go, what they do, how they divide up the landscape. Not a clue. Then they dump themselves back into a, a pond or a lake, particularly beaver ponds, turn green, and live 25 to 30 more years as adults. <laughs> these things are so incredibly toxic that not even a blue jay will eat these. But one of the great photos of all times in Scientific American is a barfing blue jay that was fed a couple of red apps and they say, Bleh! just <laughs> get me off of that. Thank you. <laughs> On the opposite extreme is the Peter Pan of all salamanders. This is a salamander that hatches out of eggs in water. There's a larval period. The thing up in the top right is a larval mud puppy. That, by the way, is a, a dragonfly nymph to its right. So you can see the size of these things. These things are striped when they're young. They lose their stripes. They become adults, but uh, never lose their larval characteristics. They keep those external gills a lateral line and a few other cool things, and live up to 40 years. There's only been two ever found in Berkshire County, Stockbridge Bowl and Lake Buell. Go find them. We don't have a clue about these things. We're not even sure if they're native, because these were commonly used in high school biology classes. And at the end of the season, when there were two or three mud puppies left, people just dumped them into ponds and lakes. It's possible these aren't even native, but we don't have a clue. Uh, okay, so next, uh, and I've got a couple of live mud puppies up here that you can take a look at. Uh, okay, Kathy, uh, so the next group are these, uh, this sort of army, the salamander underground. <laughs> and they are called that because they live underground. Herpetologists are not flowery. There's no prothonatory warblers. There's no dramatic names for things that, you know, they live underground, so they do that. Next picture. Most of you are familiar with the spotted salmon, and I have one over here um, that we finally dug out. We found it underneath one of our um, planters out in the back of BCC the other, uh, last fall and brought it in. Anyway, these things live underground all year round. In another couple of weeks, when the ground is thawed, the air temperature is over 42 degrees, and it rains like today there will be a thundering herd <laughs> through Sheffield. 
your houses will shake. <laughs> All right, maybe they won't shake. They live underground, they migrate to these pools. We don't have the foggiest idea of how they navigate to these things. These are not regular ponds and lakes, they're vernal pools. They migrate over snow and ice oftentimes, dive underwater, spend at least up to 10 days to two weeks underwater, going through this very steamy and elaborate courtship that Kathy told me not to talk about here in this group. <laughs> but if you pick up a copy of my book, it's all the dirty details. <laughs> Next picture, please. <laughs> anyway, these things go to these ponds, they lay blobs of eggs, that's a scientific term, a blob of eggs, uh, into these little vernal pools. Uh, that bottom right is the only time I ever saw spotted salamander footprints in mud in a, in a, in a road rut in the middle of the forest. And so, there you go. If you ever see footprints like that, you'll know nobody ever sees footprints. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. these things go under, in the water, and then they're back up underground in the forest doing something you don't know. They're on the surface, really underwater, for only about 10 days of a year. If you live in the dirt and you're underground, what the hell do you need polka dots for? <laughs> Why? Because the next picture will show you others that are related to them. This is um, named after Thomas Jefferson. I promise we will not have a salamander named after the current president. <laughs> I will fight that too. <laughs> oh, there is a few Democrats left. At any rate, go Bernie. At any rate, there's a point to all that. Oh, the Jefferson Salamander. Same thing, except a little weirder. It's a secret that we don't like to talk about. The thing on the top left is a perfectly good Jefferson Salamander. The thing on the right is a, um, a thing I found out in Bartholomew's Cabo with Randy Mundell a few years ago. It's chocolate brown like a spotted, like a Jefferson, but it's got all these blue fleckings on it. <coughs> and some people checked its DNA. It's, it's got an extra set of chromosomes. It's a female, and so did every other one in the pond. These are all females that are going to these ponds, they have an extra set of chromosomes, they're called triploid hybrid thingies. They dive in the water, court some male that might be around, lay eggs without fertilizing them, and the eggs develop and hatch into clones of their mothers. Some of us might be worried about this. <laughs> Not for those reasons. <laughs> because they're all identical. And if something changes in the landscape that's bad for that DNA complex, they're all dead. So we're very worried about these um, triploid Jefferson blue spotty things that we now have throughout Berkshire County. Next, Kathy, sorry. I would never have had to tell you the story except for some smart budded woods kids who went into Stock, Stockbridge, West Stockbridge, two years ago and found a population of the strangest of these underground salamanders. Unlike Spotted's and Jefferson's, they hate spring. It's too cold, too oogie, and there's too much water in these vernal pools. The, Jefferson, the, the marbled salamander migrates to these ponds in late September, digs a nest, that bottom left-hand picture, lays her eggs on land in a dry vernal pool basin, circles them, covers them, protects them from shrews or other things that are going to try and eat those eggs. And when the fall rains come and fill up that pond basin, she leaves, the eggs hatch within 24 hours, spend the entire winter under the ice, and emerge next spring or early summer. And there's a larval, uh, larval salamander there on the bottom right. This is the picture of hell if you're an invertebrate in a vernal pool. This is... This is the monster. It's going to get you. One population known. There's no reason they shouldn't be in Sheffield and every other town around here. Nobody knows. Go find them. Next. <laughs> That's your job. We do have three stream salamanders here. And virtually every stream that we have, uh, they're found here. The top one gets up to eight inches long. It's the size of the spotted salamander. It's called the spring salamander. The bottom one has sort of two dark lines down the side, so it's called the two-lined salamander. <laughs> the one on the bottom 
left is all dusky colors, so it's called hmm, the dusky salamander. <laughs> These are all stream side things. You can find them right now. I was out last week. In fact, I've got three days left. Some friends and I are trying to find a herp of the month, and uh, the best ones to find are stream salamanders in January and February. And it's, it's not fun, but it's what we do because you know, we have no lives. All right, next. <laughs> On the opposite extreme is this thing. The red back salamander, nobody has not seen one, even if you didn't know what it was. You cannot turn a log in any forest around here without seeing these three and a half inch salamanders that are super abundant and they hate the water. In fact, if you put them in water, they'll drown. <laughs> Eggs, larvae, nothing goes in water. This is entirely terrestrial. They come in different colors. If you look at that bottom left one, there's that standard striped, uh, red striped bat, but it's got a red stripe on its back. Huh, the red bat salamander. Uh, sometimes they're this gray color, and then a few of them are this fluorescent orange, especially where there's a lot of red Fs. This is the most tasty salamander we have. Everything eats it, but they don't eat a red eft. And when those monstrous thrushes are kicking through the leaf litter and they see one of these, if they've had an experience with a red eft, they won't touch it. This is a Batesian mimicry system in vertebrates, one of the few cases in the world where Batesian mimicry is, is going on. Those are the eggs of the redback salamander on the bottom right. They lay their eggs in rotting logs. The mother stays with them until they hatch. The larval stage is entirely within the eggshell, and they come out as cute little baby redback salamanders. I don't have the foggiest idea if one egg cluster will have both red, all red, gray, or striped morphed animals. Don't have a clue. Find out. Next. <sighs> Where's the couple that just brought in this dried up salamander to me this, this afternoon. Raise your hand, don't be shy. Oh, now they're not gonna to wanna to admit it. Oh, there they are, way in the back hiding so no one sees it. So they found this dried up, shriveled piece of blob, and it's a four-toed salamander. This is a salamander that looks just like a redneck. They love dry. They're up in oak forests without any water around them in midsummer. If you're lucky, you'll find one. But then, about April 10th, they'll migrate down through the forest, crossing roads, tipping cars, <laughs> getting into a wetland that's loaded with tussock sedges. Could be a beaver swamp, could be a, 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 a shrub swamp, doesn't matter as long as there's tussock sedges with sphagnum on the inside, and that picture on the right is a mother, four-toed salamander, with her eggs, and they lay their eggs in communal nurseries. You can find four or five females at the same time, now, if, with all their eggs, if you have no life. Now, the weird thing is, these things are in moss, but not in water. But the larvae have to be in water. So the moss in tussock sedge just happens to be above the water, and when the eggs hatch, the larvae wiggle through the moss, and drop into the pond that, they're, um, that the mothers found for them. This is a very strange animal. And why four toes? All of our salamanders have four toes in their front feet, but only two of them have four toes in their hind feet. This one has four toes. It's called huh, the four-toed salamander. <laughs> Mud puppies are the only other ones with four toes in their hind feet. And this is a, a, an important fact that you can't not know. That's it. <laughs> That's all there is. <laughs> so it has kind of been nice after all these years, and although I sort of painted a, a, a bleak picture, there is some great things happening. That is that Salmon sign on the right. It's right down Route 23 in Great Barrington. People, how many of you have been out helping salamanders cross the road? <laughs> Not enough. The rest of you do this. <laughs> it's not safe, but it's all right. It's important. <laughs> On the left here is 25 years ago when I was working for Massachusetts Audubon, I get a phone call from the Fauna and Flora Preservation Society in England who had just gotten international uh, publicity on toad tunnels. And they said they're coming to America and they wanted to do tunnels for toads. And one of their board directors said that I was the one that was going to help them. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? So three days later, I met with some folks who make airport runway trains in Ohio. And their plan was to find a place in Massachusetts, and since I was in the valley at that time, and Amherst was, is Amherst, 
they said, sure, we'll install these things. So I got a team of people together and we installed the first salamander tunnels in the world 25 years ago and that population is still going strong. The salamanders don't know you're trying to help them and they can't read signs. So we have fencing and lots of other stuff. But this was one of the first sort of um, important stream crossings and connectivity issues that the Berkshire Environmental Action Team has. Uh, there should be some info about them out here, and if not, you should get over there and do it. But I was especially in, impressed a few years ago when somebody came by and said, did you see that uh, billboard in, in, uh, in Dalton? And I said, what are you talking about? A sixth grade class bought a billboard and put that up and said, this is a spotted salamander with a vernal pool, and this is what they are without them. And I thought, for God's sakes, they got away from just how cool the salamanders are to their landscape, their habitat, the land trust message. This is really fantastic. All right, let's get on to some real other things. So the frogs here are spectacular. The first frog of the year, Reddy Wendell found one two days ago. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, on that 73 day, there were wood frogs moving. These things spend the winter not in water, in leaf litter in the forest floor. They get frozen solid. They become frog sibyls. <laughs> With the slightest little thawing, they start to move around. Uh, Kathy, see if you can punch that little um, sound thing in the bottom. These things sound, I don't know if it'll work or not. <gasps> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. <laughs> So they quack like ducks. You can go to Fountain Pond and hear the ducks. It's wood frogs. <laughs> go to any vernal pool. Wood frogs are quacking this time of year. The males tend to be chocolate brown. The females tend to be reddish. When they hatch from those blobs of eggs, about 1,000 eggs per blob, the tadpoles live in herds. And they migrate through ponds, filtering plankton, phytoplankton, just like sperm whales just like the great whales are doing the same thing. They taught the whales how to do this. <laughs> they were here before them. Get me off of this one quick. <laughs> help me, help me here to push the button. Stop fighting. Put an arrow. I'm hitting. So the peepers, of course, are the first frogs of the season that most people hear, even though the wood frogs are out there. Males set up territories just like our songbirds. It's only a foot in diameter, but it's all they need. When you hear this peeping, these are males on territory. If you hear this, it's when another male is challenging a male for his territory. And that little trill says, I'd like that piece of property. <laughs> and the other male says, oh no, you don't. There, just heard it. At any rate, you can watch these things wrestle. This is real wrestling, not like others you see on television. Move us along, Kathy. Oh, they live on land as well. Now, this is kind of weird. We have two spotted frogs. Uh, one has leopard spots, so we call it huh, the leopard frog. <laughs> the other one, I don't know why we call it a pickerel frog, but we do. This leopard frog, uh, the state folks had us out for the last three years tape recording these songs of these leopard frogs because a brand new species was just found on Staten Island. <laughs> Unknown. Staten Island has not been a wilderness for a long time. <laughs> well, depending on your point of view, I understand. <laughs> and we're not sure how far north it came. So they had people actually from Virginia to um, Vermont, New Hampshire, recording these. And I was out there in the rain. Uh, see if you can click that on the bottom right. Uh, sorry, the left one, yeah. And this was in Sheffield. It's the snore. The toads are <laughs> totally cool. We only have one species here. All toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. If you grow up and you're an amphibian without a tail, you're a frog. The toad groups here, the American toad, the only one we have, has this beautiful, <laughs> excuse me, there's a frog in my throat. Yeah, click that one, Kathy, thank you. Saved my life. Try 
crazy. If it doesn't do it, that's fine. Anyway, that's a male on territory. These things will breed in almost any body of water. And uh, the tadpoles are the pitch black ones, the only pitch black tadpoles we have. That's all right. Uh, yeah, you don't worry about it. It's, uh, you can't trust the toad. <laughs> Average lifespan, 35 years. All those warts, intensely strong toxin glands. Especially the ones on their shoulder, the large, look on the right hand one, that sort of large oblong blob. Those are parotid glands that make, if you've got a neighbor with a nasty puppy that keeps on barking and keeps you awake, call it over one day. <laughs> Toss it a toad. It'll take a little nibble, the toad will pop out, and the dog will drag its tongue on your driveway for about an hour. <laughs> and will never come over again. I'm trying to be practical here for... Uh, Oh, that's uh, that's a little video of that is a mass of American toads up at Mount Everest. There, uh, I estimated um, uh, thirty-seven thousand and four. <laughs> now, all of those dark colors. Hmm, it's an early spring breeder. Those dark colors, shallow water, thermal insulators. They're great. They're getting hot water from there. This is the other tree frog. The spring peeper is one. This is one that a lot of burgers thought, thank you, thought was a um, uh, red bell woodpeckers before they came out. I hear one now. <laughs> like peepers, they'll sing almost any time of the year. And they look like they're, they're lichen mimics. So this is why you have a hard time finding them. They lay eggs in water, in, especially in beaver ponds. The eggs hatch into these tadpoles that have brick red, fiery tails. Have no reason to understand why. When they metamorphose, they're emerald green. And then a year later, they're gray or green. And I don't know hardly anything about these animals, except they are about the coolest critters that we have. Get us into something else, please. Who? So you should know the two pond frogs. I've got a green frog here that we uh, maintain in BCC. Um, if you can see carefully in this bottom left-hand picture, that is a male uh, green frog. And if you can see the little spotting in the water, those are a sheet of eggs that the female deposited in his territory, and he protects the eggs from anything that might go after them. On the right is the bullfrogs. These things are massive, big, eerie things. Those are green frogs saying boot. The bullfrogs have this, there we go. You're too good. Huh. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I should have used my phone to do this. <laughs> sorry, Kevin. I told you. But anyway, let's move along. Let's get out of here. We're getting uh, pretty much done with these frogs, I think. Yeah, yeah. All right. Who? So anyway, we're going to talk about the turtles, which most of you have seen, especially when they're crossing roads to lay eggs. And this is uh, a tough time for turtles, of course. Uh, if they are successful in this picture, then you will see that uh, you might, actually you shouldn't see the eggs. The top right picture and the top left picture, this is what a nest of turtles looks like. It's underground. It's as deep as the hind legs of the turtle. All of our turtles dig with their hind legs, drop the eggs in, cover them over. If on the bottom right side you see eggshell fragments, that's a nest that's been dug up by predators. Uh, foxes, raccoons, uh, skunks, uh, dogs, domestic dogs even. It's a problem. Uh, on the bottom left are some eggs of a wood turtle that I've been studying for a number of years. And it is kind of neat, popping up all over the place, and you should do this anywhere you find turtles crossing, putting these slow turtle signs on, although it is an oxymoron. Uh -huh. If they hatch baby turtles, you just want to hug them. <laughs> Even the snapping turtle on the top left. Now, take a look at that turtle up there, and you're looking at the underside of a shell, which has virtually no bottom shell. Hence the reason snapping turtles snap. 
they bite people as often as chipmunks bite people. Every time you grab one, a chipmunk will bite you. If you grab a bluebird, it will bite you. If you grab a snapping turtle, it will bite you. Do they call them snapping bluebirds? No. <laughs> snapping turtles as if there's something weird going on here. At any rate, in the middle of the box turtle, we'll get back to these things. Okay, next. If they survive getting out of the eggs, getting out of the nest, and hatching, then there's a chance, a small chance, that they will live to be the oldest living animals on Earth. Nothing lives long, well, your third grade teacher might, but anything else. Oh, shoot, there's probably something here. No, 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 you get us out of there. This is the rarest turtle we have, and the only place it's found in Massachusetts is, huh, Sheffield. This is the bog turtle, uh, in federally endangered species, state endangered species. The Nature Conservancy and the Division of Fish and Wildlife have ongoing projects to uh, count these things, protect them. If you look at that turtle on the left side, just behind its head, you see those little notches in its shell. That's how they keep track of individuals. And uh, typically, it takes three or four generations of researchers to study a turtle, because turtles last so much longer than they do. Uh, this is a turtle that used to be very common in the Berkshires. It's disappearing dramatically. We hardly see any of these spotted turtles anymore. If you see any, there's online ways to register and uh, send your data into the Division of Fish and Wildlife. You should do this. These are animals of very shallow wetlands, typically flooded meadows and fields. Okay, Kathy, the painted turtles, much more common because these bask a lot. And basking is an important behavior, not only for keeping warm, but also for getting rid of ectoparasites that get leeches on them, uh, algae and a few other things. And on that top right picture, you'll often see clusters, and it turns out to be, uh, apparently, if you watch these long enough, dominance behaviors. Certain turtles are more dominant than others at getting the preferred basking sites, just like real animals. <laughs> So you saw that really small bottom shell of a snapping turtle. Come on, these things are totally cool. They are fantastic. They live anywhere. Now, everybody knows two bad things about snapping turtles, or you think you do. What's the first thing? Well, they snap. What's the other thing? <laughs> what, what's the bad thing they're supposed to eat? Ducks. Little ducks. It's barely. The, the bigger a snapping turtle gets, the more vegetarian it becomes. They finally learn, like most of us, that you should have been listening to your mother all along and eating right. The young turtles are very predacious on, they sneak up on clams and <laughs> injured crayfish, earthworms. These are animals that, anyway, where do most of those ducks go? Pickerel, pike, bass, non-native fishes that we brought in. That's what eats most of our ducks. And so what? Who cares if I eat a few ducks for God's sake? Oh, I see, the peregrine falcon. What did we used to call it? Chicken. No, what's the old name of the peregrine? The snapping falcon. <laughs> <laughs> the duck hawk. But the birders got smart. Let's change its name. Let's call it the, let's call it the wanderer. A peregrine falcon. I propose somebody come up in this room with a better name for a snapping turtle. <laughs> and then everybody will be happier to do this. Uh, okay. Now, this is a tough one. This is the smallest turtle in America and one of the s smallest five turtles on Earth. It's called the musk turtle or mm, stink pot. <laughs> okay. I have two of them over here that you can look at. Mill Pond in, in uh, Egremont is the only place one was found four years ago. They have to be in every other pond around here, and I haven't seen them, but I haven't looked very much. Find them. Now, this is a turtle that is so slow, algae sneaks up on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a musk turtle on the right that I found uh, in the Connecticut Valley, and it's completely overrun by algae. Henry David Thoreau wrote about these turtles and said, if you're ever canoeing on the edges of Walden Pond and a turtle falls into your canoe, it's one of these. <laughs> they climb into shrubbery and bask to get rid of the algae, <laughs> which actually can embed into its shell and cause some damage. But stink pots, uh, we know zero about them in the Berkshires. 
do your best and go out and find them. At night with a flashlight, look for a blob of algae swimming by. <laughs> now, three shells of turtles have been, of box turtles have been sound, seen in Berkshire County, all in Southern County. Um, Nikki, who took uh, the wound out of my sails, has a box turtle with her, it's Larry, who was found in um, northern Berkshire, up near Pittsfield, hit by a car 14 years ago. Somebody brought it to me at BCC, I looked at it, it wasn't too bad, they brought it to a vet friend, he said, that's not too bad, put some antibiotics on it, and the shell healed. But these are not found normally in Berkshire County, certainly not in northern or central county. So I didn't know where it came from, so I didn't want to release it. So one of my students decided to take it home with him. And he let him run loose in the house for the last 14 years. And then Andy last fall decided to get married and move to Florida. <laughs> I got the turtle in the, in the deal. So Larry now runs loose in my house, where for the last three months it's been sitting still. Moved yesterday for the first time in a month. And it's not going to do anything for another three or four weeks. And then it'll eat and poop and eat and poop. That's what they do. This is the oldest animal ever recorded in North America, a Connecticut box turtle that was accurately aged to 125 years. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Go ahead. Turtles have a lot of problems. And this is the wood turtle that I've been working with with students. Uh, Kyle back there who knew the latest story has helped radio track these. We've been trying for several years. Uh, over at Canoe Meadows in Pittsfield. If you're looking to try and get involved with a turtle study, we always need more people between them and Mass Audubon uh, who own Canoe Meadows. We've been tracking a dozen of these things for the last 15 years. Next picture. I'll show you, this is what their maps look like. If you look at the little dots on the right are the red dots, blue dots, and yellow dots. The red dots are a female wood turtle. The yellow dots are a male. And the blue dots are a juvenile that we followed for two years each and they spent time in different parts of the stream. This is a very, very interesting beginning of a long-term study that we hope to continue. Okay. There are nice things happening, except Rennie is a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> but he's finding spotted turtles. And more people are putting up turtle crossing and nesting signs too, so this is making me feel a little bit better. And I think the last group that I'll show you, obviously, are the snakes. Um, they come in all shapes, shapes and sizes, but they basically are pasta. Uh, they're just long string things, next picture. Uh, we don't have to worry about the sounds of, of snakes, you know, to any of those. Uh, so we have a couple of striped snakes. Uh, we have, what do you call that thing, a ribbon snake, a <laughs> uh, garter snake. Uh, next picture, they are found in lots of habitats. Every snake has to shed its skin. We shed our skins, but in tiny little patches here and there. Uh, snakes do it all at once. You see its eyes are beautiful robin's egg blue. And then they'll shed their skin with about five or six days, without which they can't keep growing. So you can find shed skins. I've got a couple of shed skins over here, a rattlesnake, I think, I brought with me. When we get more snakes, half of our snakes lay eggs. The other half have live young. Uh, these are garter snakes up there uh, meeting each other. That's, those are water snakes, sort of, uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, the middle <laughs> thing is a rattlesnake filled with babies. They have live young. And that is a rat snake egg that's hatching uh, down in the Connecticut River Valley. If you are really good eyes, oh yeah, I miss Gary Larson. <laughs> anyway, on the left side <laughs> is a mother rattlesnake that I found a few years ago. And I was carefully looking at her, and she kept following me which is not unusual, I don't follow in crawling, but her head. She had six babies with her. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Oh my. The one that was on her back was slipped underneath there, and there were three more over on this side. Apparently, even rattlesnakes have maternal behavior, and they care for their young at least for a little while because everything eats little tiny pieces of spaghetti. <laughs> So they need all the help they can get. Uh, the two striped snakes we have, the garter snakes on the left, the ribbon snakes on the right. Ribbon snakes are very semi-aquatic animals. That's where you're going to find them. Garter snakes everywhere. Uh, this, is the, this is sort of the, the, the uh, I don't know what, the robin of the snake world. They're found in every kind of habitat you can imagine. Go ahead. Now, how about naming these snakes? If you have a snake that's all green, what would you call it? 
Yeah. How about one that's all brown? Yeah. Try the next two. Why don't you call one with a ring around its neck? I thought I'd have Oh, sorry. Huh? What'd you call it? Ring neck snake. Yeah. How about one with a red belly? I can't explain it. At least red bellies come in different colors. They're brown ones, gray ones, reddish ones. Totally cool. The only time I ever found ring neck snake eggs was a few years ago in Mount Washington. They look like good and plenties. They don't taste like them, but they are totally cool little tiny eggs. Bring it up. And what about a snake that lives in the water? What would you call it? It's the water snake. For God's sakes, what is going on with this herpetologist? Nothing. Go ahead. And why did I put that up there? What is this thing? And why is it called a milk snake? Lives in barns. Dewey, who must have had a farm around here <laughs> while he was inventing that awful system. <laughs> and all of these early 18th and 17th century farmers saw milk snakes in their barns and were sure that these things crawled into the barn, glommed down to the faucets of a cow, and drank their milk. <laughs> Snakes have six rows of really sharp, pointy teeth. <laughs> Cows have big, heavy feet and hooves. And how's Charlie back there about getting stepped on one? These are big. They can get up to three and a half feet long. I met a person years ago who told me he watched a milk snake crawl into a field, wrap its body around all four legs of the cow so it couldn't run. <laughs> and still had enough space to reach down and drink the milk. <laughs> aliens. <laughs> That's the alien story. It's not possible. Of course, these are, they eat two things, however, small mammals and other snakes. Uh, very interesting um, behavior of these things. Okay, uh, we're getting close to being done. And the most endangered snake I've already told you about, the, uh, the timber rattlesnake, they come in different colors. Uh, we do have a long-term project going on here in the Berkshires as, as well as elsewhere, and I'm hoping beyond hope that maybe this is a species that will not disappear. It is the most endangered vertebrate animal in the Northeast. Both New York State, next picture, uh, Kathy, and uh, Massachusetts is now coming up, Mass is now coming up with a new sign on the parks around here where you're likely you have a small chance of seeing this endangered species. A lot of the wording is stolen directly from New York. Sarah, thank you so much for uh, doing that. And the hope is that people will continue to report them. And as I say, I'm getting calls from people who aren't afraid of snakes, or even if they are, they're not killing them. We can move them away from people's houses. We can move them elsewhere. You've got a handout that we made for you earlier today to help you identify any of these things. And if you need more help, then certainly give us a call up at, uh, up at BCC. And I want to end here by thanking the Sheffield Land Trust for bringing all of you folks out here for a nice Sunday afternoon. Thank you.
you know, this thing, like the toads, spend a huge amount of time underground. Toads less so, they're more terrestrial. If you turn over a log or your, your uh, what do you call that thing under the spout, that cement thing under your water. And if you turn that over, you'll find an American toad, period. Those are on the surface most of the year, but in the winter, they've got to dig down. Toads have digging um, spades on their hind feet, which they... <laughs> <laughs> Which they just dig down and spiral into the, into the ground, and they must be down four feet because they'll die in the cold. Wood frogs, spring peepers, gray tree frogs, leaf litter, frozen solid, thaw them up. Every year, every month of the year, you can hear a spring peeper. Somebody must have heard them the last Wednesday. 70 degrees. Next morning, 32. <laughs> Second uh, question, our uh, dog uh, got uh, into one of those guys and uh, was foaming his mouth and uh, you know, got really sick. What, uh, do you know what to do with a dog that has gotten in contact with uh, one of those? It was uh, a king of dogs, it was a chihuahua. Exactly. I'd say it was an even match for the other <laughs> Typically, the half the amount that it makes them a chihuahua. I don't care about <laughs> And a normal sized dog, or even a normal sized bird, like a blue jay, if they swallow one, half the amount it takes to kill them makes them barf it up. And that's all you need to do, just keep them alive. So the foaming is, is good. It's getting rid of... It's disgusting. Get rid of the chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> that's all part of the natural process of excavating the toxins. But there's yeah, they no are toxins. antidote. There's What's no that? antidote. Nothing that you can no, do. Not, there's no real need to for that. Okay. Yeah. Except if you want to get some sleep. <laughs> yeah, it was up all night. <laughs> What's a dog doing outside at night? Right, right before going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Got in uh, there's hours. enough. How long did it bark for? I mean, this is about, fascinating. About four hours. Four hours? Four hours. Yeah. yeah just a chihuahua? Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing inside it to go in. It's foaming and foaming and foaming. <laughs> did, did it swallow the toad? No. 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 It just bit it. Just bit it. Yeah. 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 Could the toad kill the uh, toad? I don't know. Is there enough poison there to actually die? <laughs> 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 Basically sedentary in the water all winter long. 
rivers and lakes. Yeah? You had mentioned a frog that the temperature has to be, I believe it was a frog or a toad, my apologies. It has to be all old. All toads are frogs. Okay. I'm glad I didn't take you. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. I would love you. But, anyway, but this is, so you had said that it has to be 42 or over. Then these wonderful creatures come out. So this is the big out. migration of spring amphibians. Wood frogs, spotted salamanders, Jefferson salamanders, blue spotted salamanders, uh, four toad salamanders. <laughs> so, there's a point to all that. Oh, so that is the, those are the cues for that spectacular migration. Literally, tens of thousands of amphibians start on that same big night. Sometimes we get a partial rain and it's not such a big, big event, but when it hits all at once, it is really one of the great animal phenomenon of the world. So once that hits, yeah. then let's say the next night it's 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. Do they go back underground or they find ponds or they in just... They're vernal pools and they'll stay there. They're just, back, they find the pools to and we're done. Conditions, they're still in the ponds. Okay. Males get together in a large group and a group of salamanders is called a congress. <laughs> <laughs> How do they affect it? Oh, I thought you were expecting me to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> the highest concentration of PCBs in anything ever recorded was a Hudson River snapping turtle that had more PCBs in its tissues than anything else. It was still alive. We don't know if it affected its reproductive ability or its longevity. Nobody studies these things, partly because they live longer than we do. Uh, the likelihood of that having no effect is zero. What are the effects? GE isn't spending a nickel on it. They're spending millions of dollars saying that we don't need to clean up the PCBs. <laughs> so good reason not to use pesticides in the yard. Well, pesticides uh, are very effective on the amphibians. Amphibians don't have scales, feathers, fur. They have a very highly permeable skin. In fact, a lot of these animals, like the red-backed salmon and the woodland thing, all of its oxygen comes directly through its skin. And so does all of the toxins. So they are, and so when we take kids out on walks and talks, you know, we can handle these things, but we want to make sure they have, don't have bug repellent on, uh, for sure. Yeah? Um, do you know if um, there's other people, like where I live, three frogs in the past three years, down here, and really? not gone, and they were like really, really out there all the time. Not a clue. Not a clue. Um, yeah, I think it's, but it's not an unheard of story, that's the sad part. The, I mean, why would you want to lose the frogs? Although I have, you know, been on the phone at whatever throughout about the Pleasant Valley, now at the UCC, but mostly there, people would call, and I would hear these people saying, what the hell is that nasty noise I'm hearing outside? It's a chorus of spring peepers that I can't get to sleep. My dog made a choke now. <laughs> I said, how long have you lived there? She said, well, we just moved in this last year. And I said, where were you before? I was in the Bronx. <laughs> How could you possibly think this is noise? <laughs> it's what you used to like this. So typically, it's either a forest, you know, the great tree frogs are forest animals up in the trees. They probably overwinter in old woodpecker nesting holes and under the bark. Uh, of trees, uh, but mostly they're in the leaf litter for the winter. But the rest of the year they're up in the trees. And they will vocalize if the nighttime temperature gets over 52 degrees. Somebody help me. Yes. Um, have they ever tested the pressure on, on a snapping turtle's jaws? Because I yeah, somebody has, and I can't remember, but it's impressive. Because people let little kids get near near a, a large size snapping turtle, and it could take his finger off in a heartbeat. Yeah, so. <laughs> 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 I 
Uh, I'll put a first. <laughs> uh, yeah, they are. They can easily take your finger off, but they tip. The, the only reason snappy turtles are snapping is because they don't, they can't fit in a shell. There's no fitting. Uh, can you toss me this little shell here? I'm sorry. So here's a young snappy turtle. I found the shell on a railroad track. A lot of turtles die in railroads. They get caught in them and stuff. But here is the bottom shell. You can't fit inside this. So they protect themselves, as I said, just like chipmunks, just like bluebirds. And the only time you see turtles out typically is a female looking for a nesting site. Typically the same nesting site that they've used for decades. Those are all disappearing. So oftentimes they'll just lay eggs on the side of a road, which has a tiny chance of any of those babies surviving because of, of highway mortality. So when they're out, out of the water, in the heat, they are not in any way able to protect themselves other than biting. And so they are strong. And yes, it has been measured. I don't know what the numbers are, but it's a lot of pounds per square inch. Easy enough to hurt something. Yes. Do the babies come back to where they were hatched, or is it just... Not that anybody studied. Nobody lives long enough to study it. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem with turtles. Yeah. Once we put those in, I started getting calls from around the country. Um, they're in San Francisco, they're in Houston, they're in Austin, there's um, two or three in Michigan. Um, but now people are doing bigger things. You know, those little airport runway drains only have about a nine inch diameter. They're now putting in much bigger units so that they can get that plus a whole bunch of other things through that. So there are a fair number of them around. There's probably 30 in the United States now. But they, people mostly now are moving to larger things or bigger animals. Hello. We have a number of turtles crossing the road in the spring. Can you help us how we can help them get across the road? It's, well, if, I mean, if you're talking about snapping turtles, I usually have a shirt or a jacket, an old blanket in my car. Hey, <laughs> Toss it on it. Let them bite into that. Do not do what the old guys used to do. Pick them up by the tail. Because you're going to be separating vertebrae. What you can do, the hardcore people, and I, I'm not, I just chicken. I don't know why. The biggest snapping turtles, you can actually run your hand up over their back of the tent butt into their shell and grab them on the top and they can't reach over the top. They go around the sides and go underneath, but they can't come over the top. And if you pick them up that, I don't do that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Have them all. <laughs> so, what I do is just throw something over it and then what I do, I do hold it by the tail and then I put my hand underneath to balance them. And then I'll walk them over and put them to the edge of the room. Yeah. yeah, unless I have a student with me, and they're, they're the best thing. <laughs> yes. Do you see them in your yard? Like, oh, sorry, what's your, that? I'm sorry. If you see them in your yard and you live near wetland, is there anything, any smart thing you can do in your yard to help them have a wetland attack? If you don't mind what they're doing, typically, if they're not nesting in your yard, typically around your house, foundation, plantings, or in a garden, a great place for them. Uh, then they're just walking through to get somewhere else. So, nope, just keep an eye on them. <laughs> you could write a novel. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so I wonder how long do they um, um, stay in the shell? Do they do that all through their mouth? Most turtles have a very delayed. Um, uh, maturation age. So snapping turtles probably take 10 to 12 to 15 years before they're mature. Okay. Spotted turtles probably less than that, probably 6 to 8, maybe 10 years. Most turtles can't breed until they're 10 to 15, <laughs> and maybe a few even to 20 years old. And then they will breed. There's no reason to think they can't breed up into their last year. <laughs> Turtles and snakes have what's called indeterminate growth. It's like a lot of plants. They never stop growing throughout their lives, although it's so minuscule you can hardly measure it. Although you keep measuring it, but it doesn't, it's not, a, it's, it, so as far as we know, they're reproductive throughout their entire lives. Do they stay in the same habitat? Because we're a big pond. You mean habitat or, or landscape or home range? Well, 
So they stay in the same pond, is that what you're asking? <laughs> Most of the time they do, but some turtles and other amphibious reptiles who have co-evolved, especially with beavers, like the spotted salamanders, like um, newts. In fact, I think the red F stage, the, the fluorescent orange things, are the searching stage for new beaver ponds. Before we wiped out beavers, they, a beaver dams a little stream, makes a pond, creates a dam, makes a pond, lives there for 20 to 25 years or so, somewhere 20 to 30 years. Then all the food that's easily accessible is gone. So they stop working on the dam, they move upstream or downstream to create another dam, and that pond disappears back into the stream, leaving behind some of the richest, most spectacular organic soils with rare plants in it that have survived underwater for 20 plus years and then only sprout after 15 or 20 years into the next pond, they go up or downstream. Eventually, they'll go back to the same pond when all the aspens and other things come back. It's my opinion, totally unfounded, but since no one else is doing it, I can make it sound like it's fact. <laughs> <laughs> These red F stages are looking for the new beaver ponds. Hang around there. Once they become mature after 10 to 12 years, turn green, dive in the water, become mature, and live another 15 to 20 years after that. I think beavers, and I think like, like moose, red spotted moose, are co adapted with beavers. How do I know? <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, for, help, for helping a uh, snapper get across, a, it's almost what you did, except that, I mean, I take an old rag shirt, whatever it is, and let the snapping turtle bite it, and then we carry it away. Whatever works. <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah. I mean, I know people have snow shovels in the summer to shovel them into boxes or baskets. Whatever, to me, it's fantastic. Uh, it's fantastic that anybody is actually doing this in this day and age. It's wonderful that this is happening. So do your best to keep them going. Yeah. These, these frogs that freeze, that freeze solid, the frog yeah. sickles, what, what keeps them from popping? Two mechanisms. One is that they, uh, in the late summer, they start developing a lot of glycogen in their ah, tissues, which lowers the freezing point. Right. But that only lowers it down to about 24 degrees. It gets colder than that, as you know. So below that, they start to uh, release all the water from their cells into their empty body cavity. And that's what freezes and expands, as you would imagine. So there's no damage to tissues. Once it starts to get warm, that ice cube in their body cavity basically um, uh, what do you call it? melts and rehydrates their cells. And the first thing the speakers do is pull the speaker. And then <laughs> that night it's full. So it's two things. One is lowering the freezing point, and second, expelling water from the cells so that damage doesn't occur. Everybody should know that's what frostbite is. You, you, your, your water freezes. It's the only weirdest thing on the planet. It, it expands when it's a solid instead of shrinking. Uh, I tell uh, my students at BCC, if you want to be a millionaire, go to some bar on the weekend. No, I don't tell them that. Really. <laughs> <laughs> go to your favorite soda shop. <laughs> Mine happens to be the Barrington Brewery. <laughs> and uh, you get a bunch of people who aren't all there. <laughs> Have the bartender fill up a, a glass filled with ice cubes right to the top, and then pour water in so that one more drop, it'll spill over. But just before that, have it filled, and then bet people what's going to happen when the ice melts. And most of them will say, it's going to overflow. And it doesn't. <laughs> I don't know why I haven't done it. <laughs> Someday I'll get it. Anyway, so how about a normal question? <laughs>